Start rolling. All right. Uh, have you started rolling? Right now. Okay. So, uh, for the American audience, could you please explain uh, who you are and why uh, you're significant in New Zealand politics? Uh, well, I'm not sure I would say I'm significant, but my name's David Farah. Um, I used to work at Parliament. I spent eight years working for the National Party, and around four years ago, I set up a blog called Kiwi Blog. And as blogging's caught on around the world, it also seems to have caught on in New Zealand, and it, it, it does have you know some quite good readership in New Zealand. Uh, how, how many readers would you say? Monthly, I get around four hundred thousand visits, or around a million page views a month. You never know for sure how many unique visitors there are, but there tends to be uh, around 10,000 people a day, I'd say. Okay. And um, what do you see as the role of the blogosphere in New Zealand politics? Is it, is it becoming uh, a major part of uh, New Zealand politics, or does it have a way to go? No. If you'd asked me before the last election, I would have said and did say it was quite minor. I think actually in the last year we've seen it become um, a lot more influential. A lot of issues have started on the blogosphere. Lines that you see on blogs get picked up by media, picked up in the house, etc. And you know, during debates on bills, people have referred to blogs quite a bit there. So no, it is not perhaps to the same extent in the US yet, but certainly growing a lot in the last couple of years. So, um, we talked to Bill English, uh, who is the deputy uh, uh, leader of the National Party, and he expressly credited you with leading the charge against the electoral finance. Yeah, that's probably a fair call because I was very early on with the analysis at looking at, my God, this is going to affect what people can do in these ways. Um, and I've sort of got passion on that subject. I, I, I know the Electoral Act very well and think it's an incredibly important act because it's the equivalent of your constitution. It defines how we run our elections. Uh, so that is the issue where the blogs and myself especially have had a big impact on it. So, um you were actually here protesting, uh, leading the charge uh, physically as well as online. A accidentally leading, that was very funny. Um, there was a protest march organised, oh, there's been half a dozen of them by John Biscowan, who I'd call an ally in this, and I turned up to support the march and got told around three minutes before it started that Wellington Airport was closed and none of the three speakers could make it and that I was now the main speaker and now leading the protest march. So you imagine this sort of um, gives you pause and you're thinking, oh my God. Uh, but in the end it was a lot of fun. We had a counter protest turn up, lots of MPs were there to speak to us. Um, and yeah, it was a new experience. Um, and this may sound like a uh, weird question, but uh, when you were protesting, did you have uh, any fear of being arrested or no, away? No, no, none at all. Um, it's very difficult to get arrested on a protest march in New Zealand. You actually have to get quite violent and offensive. Um, and I think it was probably the most well-behaved, mild-mannered march um, we've had. Yeah, well look, I don't see blogging as competing with mainstream media, I think they're actually quite com complementary to each other. Blogs will often be first to break stories, uh, to break an issue, um, and that's why a lot of the media have started to blog. In fact, all three newspapers, the major dailies, have set up blogs for their press gallery journalists. Um, and blogs feed off a lot of the stories you get from the mainstream media. But having said that, often blogs can contribute to those stories. So I like to think it's a symbiotic relationship. And um, do you think that uh, the mainstream media really understands uh, the tactics of electioneering involved in MMP? I think everyone's still learning to some degree about it. There's no, the only other country that really has it's Germany, etc. So. Um, everyone's still learning, but I think most people have actually caught on that it's all about maximising the party vote, but also having coalition partners. It's not about, uh, it's very hard to get to 50%, um, so you're going to need the support of some minor parties. Unlike in the United States, where you can often win on 40% of the vote under MMP, you and your allies need to get 50%. 
I call a centre-right blog, it depends a bit on how you define conservative, because um, on an economic scale, in terms of, of centre-right, right-wing, definitely, but I tend to identify myself as what used to be called a classical liberal, one who's quite liberal on social issues, I've worked with the Labour government on members' bills, with, <laughs> and I've just been shattered by oh, no. a bird that was passing by, this will form a good part of the documentary. Yeah. Uh, we've all been hit. Good uh, luck if you're Jewish. This is my second time in New Zealand that that has happened. Uh, yes, it's and not uncommon. Uh, We're not actually under a tree, that's about normally yeah. you have to be... Yeah, that, that is kind of weird. Okay, um... <laughs> now what was that question? I don't remember, I'm still getting... <laughs> used to be crapped on by a pigeon. Yeah. Yes. No, no, no. Do you think uh, the media has really gotten uh, MMT? Yeah, as I said, uh, largely it has. The key thing is, uh, unlike the US, you need to get up to 50% with you and your allies. You can't count on vote splitting like you do in the US. Okay. And um, do you think that there's, uh, that there's as much popular skepticism in the political process today as there was under first past the post? Yeah, I think there is. In fact, uh, the majority of people in polls tend to say we'd like to go back to first past the post. I don't personally agree, uh, but they tend to think it hasn't sort of delivered what some of the promoters said it would. Um, do you think there's more particip uh, political participation in New Zealand now that there is MMP? Or? It did increase after MMP came in. The number of people who vote went up. But since then, it has dropped down to below what it used to be. I think my gut instinct is it must have to some degree because you used to have a lot of wasted votes. If you lived in a safe seat, your vote was absolutely wasted. Now, pretty much everyone's vote does count to some degree. Um, do you think uh, MMP's made politicians? Yes and no. A lot would argue that what we call list MPs, who are put on the list by the party, and they get in depending on how many votes you get, aren't accountable because you can't easily get them out of office. Okay, just because that plan. Uh, it's definitely a centre-right blog. I've been aligned and associated with the National Party pretty much since my first year at university. But it's not quite like in the United States, for example, where people, Republicans, often will be socially conservative and economically right-wing. There's quite a few people in New Zealand who support national and economic policies, but we're actually quite socially liberal. I've worked with the Labour government on things like civil unions, um, prostitution law reform, and helped organise a lobby group to keep the drinking age at 18. So the right-left spectrum has some limited use, but in terms of how most people would uh, say, yes, I'm on the right. So uh, do you think uh, New Zealand conservatism and um, American conservatism is a different to a great degree? Oh, hugely. Look. The last debate about abortion in New Zealand was in the 1970s. It, it isn't an issue anywhere, I mean, sure, a few people, but I've never heard it asked at a candidate's meeting. Um, those big issues don't polarise the country anywhere like they do in the United States. It's not to say you still don't have uh, more people on the right tend to be, well, I'd say, morally conservative, but it's nowhere near like it is in the US. Uh, do you think that... Um do you think that uh, MMP having uh, the ability uh, to have parties that campaign on socially conservative issues, do you think that that has allowed National to be more socially moderate, socially liberal? To some degree, I think for all the parties, the fact that what had to be used to be a very broad church, you can have factions break off into their own parties and still have the chance of making parliament. And Rather they've not yet made it, there have been Christian parties try to get into Parliament and the United Future Party merged with a Christian party um, and has, has been in Parliament. So yeah, to some degree I think that's true. Well, the United Future recently, uh, Gordon, uh, yeah, Gordon Copeland left uh, 
uh, United Future. That's right. It looks like that whole merger of United and the, the Christian Party, uh, that's no longer, um, uh, that's kind of breaking apart. What, what do you think is going to happen there? It has broken apart. I don't think the breakaway factions have any chance of making 5%. <laughs> United Futures at 1-2% to 2 in the polls. They hold an electorate seat though, which will still get them back into Parliament. So they may still have one or two MPs, but the breakaway Christian groups, I think it's highly unlikely they'll get into Parliament. So, uh, Gordon Coles' chances? 0.1%. Uh, no, not even that, to be honest. Nothing. Um, do you think MMP has made politicians more accountable? Some politicians it has. There is a lot of disquiet about the fact that list MPs are effectively appointed by the party. You can't, as in first past the post, just say let's vote this person out of their electorate and they're out of parliament because they can still come back in on the party list. But in other ways it has made it more accountable in that um, if a party becomes unpopular they'll lose office even if they're good at, at targeting marginal seats. Really, everyone's vote now counts. Do you think that if, um, and I pose this question to um, uh, uh, Marion Hobbs, um, let's say that aliens abduct Michael Cohen, not to the knowledge of uh, all of us, and uh, they program him to act in a completely irrational manner. He's uh, deputy uh, prime minister. Do you think that he'd stay on the list, and uh, that would affect uh, Labour's votes? Uh, or do you think that he'd uh, be kicked off the list and held accountable by his party because they don't, they know that they need every vote under MMP and in that yeah. way, by the people holding the parties accountable, yeah. the parties then hold the yeah. MMPs accountable. Oh look, that's certainly an argument and it's true to some degree. Very senior MMP. Top three or four. Beyond that, um, most MPs being on the list or off the list won't affect that because look, the average voter doesn't know who's on the party list. They can name the PM, the leader of the opposition, maybe one or two cabinet ministers like Cullen. Beyond that, um, they don't really know who's on the party list. Um, when people vote in MMP though, are they voting for the policies of the party or the people in the front of the party? Or basic, pol uh, basic personalities versus ideas? Oh, both. Absolutely. We'd like to think everyone votes on policies. I think it's actually very much perception. Do they like the leader is a big part. Do they like the policies is certainly a part. Sometimes it's just, look, I think the incumbents, it's time for a change. There's a saying, in fact, oppositions don't win, governments lose, and I think that can't be underestimated. How much it isn't about what the opposition is offering, but just that we don't like what the current government's doing. And that's not just their policies, that's scandals, crises, how they've managed that. Um, how has uh, MMP affected the lives of New Zealanders who don't follow politics or current events? Not at all, really. Um, probably the only real effect has been that when it took 10 weeks to negotiate a government, Everyone thought this was quite amusing that we went for three months without having anyone running the country. Uh, but MMP affects the political system, but it doesn't affect uh, the average New Zealander a lot. Except, as I said, at election time, it does mean every person's vote effectively counts. Um, and I think that is a good thing. What do you see as the greatest single benefit of MMP? I said before that if every person's vote counts. Second biggest benefit would be the diversity it's brought to Parliament, where I think it's allowed parties to look at getting a balanced caucus. They might say, we're going to win these 20 seats. Who would be good to bring in to complement those 20 MPs on top of that? And what would you say is the single greatest drawback? The biggest drawback, I think, is that it can be very difficult to govern because you can rely on one, two, maybe even three other parties to pass laws. It doesn't necessarily mean that the only laws you pass are acceptable to everyone. It can mean lowest common denominator, that you, know, you have to compromise so much you can't be effective. Okay. Um, what modifications would you make to the electoral system if you had the chance? Oh, dozens. Um, 
there, there's many I would make. Um, I would probably get rid of the loophole that allows a party to get list MPs if they win an electorate seat. I'd have the barrier for all parties being you have to get 4%. This is quite important as it comes from Germany again that if you allow parties in on 1, 2% they'll be very extreme parties but they'll get disproportionate power and that's actually partly um, what happens in Israel where the religious extreme parties because they can come in on 1% um, hold a lot of power and can bring down governments. Um, I think there needs to be much bigger penalties for breaches of the electoral law. We saw some massive breaches at the last election and it was amazing the police didn't prosecute, but even if they had, maximum fine was $4,000. Um, do you think that, um, do you think that the uh, MP system would work in the US? It can work anywhere. Uh, whether it would be possible to change, I'd say it would be impossible to get constitutional change uh, to do it. But no, MMP and similar systems work throughout Europe quite successfully. Uh, but like I say, it is very much a matter of uh, what people are used to and being persuaded to change. And especially with the two-party system so dominant in the US, I can't see either would be very keen to give that up. Well, that's pretty much all I had. Uh, Helen, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I do have a few questions. Go I'll for get it. you to direct your interviews to Brian. Uh, yep. Direct your answers to Brian for the camera's sake. Uh, and I'll just give them. Yeah, I try to keep. Thanks. Cool. So you mentioned before that there's been a lot of criticism of MMP. Do you think that's just people, you know, sort of generally want to bitch about politics, or is, they got some, is there something to what they're saying? Is a bit of both again, it sounds like an always waffling, but a lot of it is just they don't like politics, so they now blame MMP because it's a change that happened to it. But there are some legitimate criticisms where I think the promoters of it over-egged what it would achieve and people feel disappointed. They also felt that they were going to get a second vote and they've never had the chance to say, do we want to carry on with it? I think if you had that second vote, people would then accept MMP is here to stay, assuming it won. And could you summarise briefly your view on the electoral finance bill? Oh, uh, anti-democratic, suppressing criticism of the government basically. Um, there are some need for some changes to stop third party campaigns having no limits. But what they've done is bring down very low limits, much below the neutral officials intended. And they've also extended what an election ad is. It used to be you know, a newspaper ad, a radio ad, a billboard, but they've now said it's any form of word or graphic. So it can be a protest placard, a post into an internet news group, a chalk slogan on the ground. So they've absolutely overstretched. And um, I've been, as you know, leading a campaign against it. I actually agree with some of the sentiments of wanting change, but this isn't the answer. So you're not against the idea of it, you're just against Maybe, maybe you need to go back to the drawing board on it, but uh, theoretically you think it could be amended to, to something that could work, maybe? No, the current law starts on a basis of we want to regulate everything and then give a few exemptions. The law should start from a narrow base and look at do we need to expand it. Um, yeah, so no, you can't just amend the current law. It will need to be repealed. But the, but the sentiments... Oh, I expected to be supporting the bill when it came out. I thought I would want some changes to it, but I absolutely expected that I would be supporting this bill. And it's only when I read it and realised what they had done that I decided over a period of around a couple of days, no, you can't just amend this, this has to be thrown away. And what's your view on the 5% threshold? Is it too high, too low, about right? I think 4%, the Royal Commission recommended 4%, and I think 4% is probably a good place to set it. And uh, what about the, the three-year terms? The... Oh, I've long been an advocate of four-year terms. I think five is too long. But the trouble with three-year terms, your first year is paying off your campaign promises. Your third year is starting to make those promises. It only really gives you one year to actually get on with governing without worrying about elections. So I think a four-year term would be a, a big step forward. But the public have twice rejected it. Nandor Tangos 
said almost exactly the same thing as you just did. So, um, but there is another thing that uh, Helena Katz said. Under First Past the Post, they said that there would be almost no support for a four-year term because that's too long between elections. Uh, and um, governments under First Past the Post could pass laws very, very quickly. Uh, do you think that if you had a First Past the Post system that you would still support four years? I, I support four years regardless of the system. It would be interesting under MMP to uh, do another re referendum at some stage, but um, I don't think there's probably a climate at the moment to leaving MPs in office for longer than, than they currently have. All right, uh, hello. Sorry, if, if you wanted to use that answer, the, the, there the was car. interference, sorry. Uh, would you, uh, I'll re-ask him that. Uh, would you still support for your term under first pass the post? Yeah, no, I'd support a four-year term regardless of electoral system. I'd also actually support a fixed term too. I think it would be very good to know when the election will be in advance rather than have to spend half your time guessing about it, especially that you have spending limits that cut in 90 days before and you don't find out the um, election date till six weeks before. So you're actually halfway through your spending period before you know you're halfway through it. It really <laughs> he makes it difficult. Maybe the Electoral Finance Bill will hurry that up. Well, the one good thing in the Electoral Finance Bill is they ha have gone to a fixed date for when the spending period starts. The bad thing is they've set it way too early. 1 January means all of election year. A fixed date, though, of 1 September or even a bit earlier than that, I think would be a great thing. Uh, but you don't want to have your entire year as a regulated period. Um, have you got a pick who's going to win the 2008 election? Um, around a month ago I would have only been 60-40 for National. Um, even though they've led in the polls all year, they don't have as many coalition partners as Labour. But after the last month I would be saying it's now up to 70-30 likely National. Uh, that's still a significant chance that Labour can pull back enough support but the, the thing I hear around the press gallery is that the last few weeks have been like an extended suicide note for the government. They've just been doing very stupid things with the uh, Erin Lee affair, etc. Refusing to apologise. Apologies cost nothing. Refusing to apologise costs votes. Mm. And the, um, but it's still 11 months out when we're recording this. So. And there's a lovely saying by Harold Macmillan, events dear boy, events. And that's why I wouldn't go beyond 70-30, because you don't know what will happen next year, what will be in the budget. Uh, there might be a big climate change disaster that will help the Green Party, etc. Um, but at the moment, you know, it's looking very tough for Labour. Any government's hard to win a fourth term, um, and they're not doing the smart things you need to do to be able to win a fourth term. Someone said to me, whenever the country's losing in sport, there's a change of government afoot. Yeah, it's a bit of an urban legend, that one. I'm not sure if it, it holds totally true. But what is true is the mood of the country is very important. If the country feels good about itself, they are more likely to re-elect the government. But that's no guarantee in itself. John Howard just lost massively, but the confidence direction in Australia was very positive. Um, so it helps you get re-elected, but it's not a guarantee of re-election. There's also, um, uh, uh, actually, what, what do you think about, um, about the fact that under MMP, most of the government, and you only have four elections, but most of them have resulted in a Labour-led government, whereas Labour, under first past the post, seems to always be the struggling. That's correct. So, um, do you think that there's been a, a shift to the centre left in the past uh, decade or so, or has MMP and the left uh, more likely to form coalitions? Has that been to their advantage? I think Labour probably have benefited more from MMP because you used to have a lot of vote splitting on the left. You had the Alliance, you had social credit. Sorry, guys, got to pause again. Uh, pretty significant because some of the options aren't too attractive, um, especially for national. 
Um, Winston, I mean, I have got a strong opinion on Winston Peters, but I think it would be very difficult to be able to trust him after what happened with the previous coalition. The Māori Party are interesting. I understand there's a lot of goodwill and trust between the MPs and National and the Māori Party, but their problem may be a different one, just can you actually get policy alignment there? Um, so, so the irony is you've probably got better policy alignment with New Zealand First, but uh, no trust, good trust with the Māori Party, but less policy alignment. The obvious coalition partners for National are United Future and ACT, but they're both polling very low. Um, Raul Labour certainly has the Greens as a very solid um, potential coalition partner. Um, that, they've had some experience dealing with, with Peters too and seem to have done it quite successfully. So this is why really the challenge for National has to be, can they get enough to almost govern in their own right? And that's hard. Yep. Audio is fine, yeah. Um, and did it happen? In 1996, did Winston surprise a lot of people? Was it for people? Oh, I was gobsmacked. Um, he and Jim Bolger hated each other. We're talking visceral loathing. Um, and it, I expected, I think most people expected he would go with Labour. But over the coalition negotiations, I understand that there were a mixture of things, but part of it was Labour sort of assumed that they would automatically get to go with Winston. And we had a lot of complaints we heard later from New Zealand First that Labour were quite arrogant, took them for granted. It was really only in the last week or so I started to think, my goodness, they may be serious about it. And it became though a bit like Hollywood, where it was like the Oscars. They actually announced it live on television after a 10 minute speech. I think we've sort of moved on a bit from then. Do you think smaller parties have a sort of disproportionate amount of influence in Parliament? I think they do. I think we, we, because both parties need their votes so badly, it allows them to actually get a high return for their supporters. But not all of them have used it well. You see, because the Greens are out to one side, Labour takes them for granted. So they've actually achieved very little, generally, considering the number of votes they have. But because New Zealand First is genuinely in the middle and could go national or labour, they've managed to extract some big costs from the government, a thousand extra police, um, Winston becoming foreign minister, there was another big one that they achieved too. Um, even just now that Winston's foreign minister, he got a 30% increase in funding for his ministry. Um, no other minister can do that. So yeah, definitely there is some disproportionate power. Right, yeah. Um, and Helen, Helen Clark, I mean, is, is, is part of the reason that she's governed so, so long, do you think, that she's sort of masterful in pulling together people and maintaining a strong campaign? Look, Helen Clark's political skills, up until I would say around 15 months ago, can only be called pretty first class, etc. She's an extremely astute politician. She has managed the relationships generally quite well. She's known when to uh, take cover on an issue, when to drop an issue. In the last 15 months though, they really do seem to have lost their mojo and they've made some pretty stupid decisions where they've kept on supporting someone long beyond uh, what was politically wise. So whether you've still got that same degree of smartness, I'm not sure, but what you certainly will have is a single-minded determination to get a fourth term. So if there is any combination of parties able to keep Labour in power, I would absolutely expect that Helen Clark will promise the earth to be able to put together a fourth term. When you're in opposition, you're a bit worried about, we're coming in, this is going to be our first term in, we don't want to uh, agree to things which mean we'll be a one-term government. When you're actually there trying to get what will probably be your final term anyway, you're going to be a lot more um, willing to compromise. Mm. And um, this is a question on a slightly different tangent. Do you think, I mean, our documentary is going to be providing a forum for a lot of politicians to give their parties spit. Yeah. Do you think that's going to come in any way, shape or form under, could that be considered um, anything under the electoral finance bill? Um, I'm just trying to think actually, I, 
there is an exemption for media and for broadcasters, um, and I suspect it would be fine. Um, having said that, if you're getting close to the election, depending on where you're playing, etc. Like if TVNZ decides to play it, there's no issue because they do have an exemption. If, however, um, someone started showing it to try and help their campaign, etc., there could be issues around that. I mean, this is one of the problems with the bill that there's so much uncertainty that comes into force in a week. We even heard this week whether the Southland District Council's adverts against the loss of funding there, they may even be an election ad. So I think the lawyers are just going to have to have a lot of work next year. Cool, that's all the questions I've got, Nate. Did you want to add anything? No, that's all I've got. Is there anything you wanted to add? Nope, just it's been a pleasure. All right. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Thanks.